we're going to be focusing on making the most profitable decisions and avoiding business disasters, as well as the techniques that can be done to do so, such as the five key questions and other techniques. And I want to ask you to think about for yourself, what does it mean for you to have a business or career disaster? What does that mean in your world? Kind of imagine that. Imagine what a business disaster would look like. Whether it's a major disaster, like a all the way through a bankruptcy, serious lawsuit, a really major project going wrong, losing a huge client, or a minor disaster, like look, let's say unnecessary team conflict or heated email exchange. All of these things can be disasters. They can be mishaps, you know, tiny disasters, or calamities, major disasters. They can also be the career disasters. You know, if you make a bad impression on an important leader in your organization, that can lead to a career disaster. Or if you lose the sale, that's a really critical sale that you really should get, that can be a career disaster. And there can be many career disasters. You know, some things aren't under your control. If a company that you work for gets acquired and then everybody from the acquired company is fired, not under your control, but that's still a career disaster. So those are the kinds of disasters that we'll be talking about here and how you can address these sorts of problems. The presentation will go as follows. So first we'll talk about these disasters, why they happen and how we can address them. So that's going to be the first part of the presentation. Then we will go on to talking about, so that the first part of the presentation will be about these disasters, why they occur, some examples of them, and then of course how we can address them. So that's going to be the shape of how we go through today's time that we spend together. And at the end, we'll have a question and answer session. I'd like to start by sharing about myself, why I'm passionate about these issues. Now, I got interested in decision making, which is the key aspect of avoiding disasters a long time ago. And you might be surprised that decision making is the key aspect of avoiding disasters. But really, it's because decisions are the things that get us into business disasters and also the things that get us the most success. Those are the most profitable decisions as opposed to the most disastrous decisions. There's been quite a lot of research showing that companies succeed or fail because of the strategy of the leadership. For example, there was a study on the 51 on four, over 450 companies that had over $500 million in revenue that went bankrupt from 1981 to 2007. And no, this is just before the fiscal crisis, so it doesn't incorporate the financial crisis as an issue. So those companies went, uh, oh, somebody's coming in. Good morning from the Philippines. Welcome, Jennifer. So these companies, the 450 companies that I mentioned, the research said that 46% of them went bankrupt purely, purely just because of the strategy of the leadership at the very top. So 46% of these huge companies with over 500 million in revenue went bankrupt, again, just because of the leadership strategy. Most of the rest, 54%, could have avoided bankruptcy most likely, likely could have avoided bankruptcy, we're not certain, if the leadership strategy at the top would have been better and wouldn't have been as disastrous. And of course, strategy is about decision making. And if we look at the smaller level, entrepreneurs, startups, we know that about half of all startups close their doors within about five years of starting up. And a lot of that comes from bad decision making by startup participants. So they shouldn't have started up or they should have started up things in a different way. So that's half of all startups. So that's a big deal. Now, that applies to individual careers as well. We know from a study of over a thousand board members of companies and other organizations that fired their chief executive officers that about over 20%, over one fifth of the cause for firing their chief executive officers was denial of negative reality. So. Essentially, these chief executive officers were not willing to admit that things were worse than they actually were. 
So that's a big problem, right? <laughs> that they, they weren't willing to admit the facts of negative reality. And it's not that they were, it's not that the company was doing poorly. There are many, many executives who succeeded despite the fact that the company was doing poorly and they were able to turn things around. However, it's the fact that they weren't willing to admit, to acknowledge that the company was doing poorly, that was the major issue. So, these are some examples where really bad decisions lead to disasters for individuals, individual executives, individual startup founders, and companies, huge companies as a whole. So that's what we're going to be talking about. How do we avoid these disasters for ourselves, our careers, and for the businesses in which we're involved? Now, that's the thing that we're going to be addressing. My passion, as I said, for this came from the fact that I grew up and in a time when disasters were happening all around me. Well, first of all, when I was a kid, I saw some pretty disastrous decisions made within my household by my parents, specifically my father. He hid some money from my, my, my mother for a couple of years, and that led to some really bad tensions between them. Eventually, it led to them separating for a few years. Eventually, they got back together, but the, she could never really trust him again at that point. And so that was really bad financial decision making that led to a disaster for my parents. So I had that happen to me and observed that. When I was growing up, I was 18 in 1999. And that was the you know party like it's 1999, right? That time period. And that was the era of the dot-com boom, when a lot of companies were gaining huge amounts of money, many hundreds of millions, billions of dollars were spent on the web then, uh, boo.com, pets, pets.com, and so on. And then I was 21 in 2002 when the dot-com bust happened. And when so many companies, almost all of these companies went bankrupt. I think Amazon was the only one of these kind of high-flying <laughs> dot-comers that survived. And so that we know how that happened. That was pretty terrible. And I saw so many people suffering losing their life savings, losing so much money because of that. And that really was pretty terrible to see. But even worse was the fact that leaders in some large companies like Enron, WorldCom and Tyco cheated. They committed accounting fraud to cover up their losses. Now, the vast majority of business leaders didn't commit accounting fraud to cover up their losses, but these folks did. And you know what? They knew that they, would, they, they wouldn't be able to get away with it for more than a year or two. And it's not like they needed the bonuses for the year or two at the expense of the rest of their lives living in shame and serving long jail sentences. So why did they commit that? I mean, I was just really frustrated by that. I was looking at that and seeing how much suffering they caused for people around them who lost so much money, you know, people, employees in those companies who lost all that money when the leadership of those companies was saying, no, buy, buy our stocks while the leadership itself was selling the stocks. I mean, it was pretty pathetic. So anyway, <laughs> my value set is utilitarian. I want the most good for the most number. And that caused me to see that this is really bad and I can need to do something about this with my skill sets. So I went into speaking, consulting, coaching, training on these topics and studying these topics, of course. So a combination of studying and speaking, consulting, coaching, and training. That's where I have my over 20 years of experience. Now, at the same time, I was also, the studying part of it eventually led me into academia. So I didn't only study it outside of academia, I wanted to study it professionally, doing the research on it. So I went into academia, I spent about 15 years in academia, did a bunch of peer-reviewed research, have many papers published, and uh, I served as a professor at Ohio State for seven years, so that's kind of my background there, and research these topics. And then about a year and a half ago, I went into doing this speaking, consulting, coaching full time, not doing any more academia because I want to understand what's going on. And because honestly, I thought that I could make a bigger difference outside of academia. And so that's my background. That's my expertise. And that's my passion. Now, Agnes mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that it's based on a book. It's informed by a book and the book is coming out pretty soon. It's a book that summarizes a great deal of my business experience. 
consulting, training, coaching business leaders over these 20 years, as well as all the cutting edge research in cognitive neuroscience. So I'm a cognitive neuroscientist. That's my background. I study how people behave, why they behave this way, how our brain causes us to behave in certain ways in behavioral economics. So cognitive neuroscience and behavioral economics combined with practical and pragmatic business case studies. And the book is called Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. So that's the, what the book is about. Now, you know, I can describe, I can praise the book myself, but obviously I'm the author, I'm biased, <laughs> right? We're talk, talking about a lot about biases, but the book was endorsed by 58 prominent leaders. So I'll give you some examples. So folks who don't have any specific reason to praise the book, to endorse the book. So we have thought leaders, New York Times bestsellers, Marshall Goldsmith, Brian Tracy, Bill Denko, then leaders of large organizations that have billions of dollars, Brandy Ustra, who's the CEO of ProMedica, Larry Corman, he's the president of AKA Hotel Residences, Vivek Gupta, he's the CEO of Mastag Digital, and many more. And top academics, high level prominent academics, Amy Edmondson, she's a professor at Harvard, Jay Anand, he is a professor at Ohio State University, and Leonard Schlesinger, Len, he is again also a professor at Harvard. So we have really prominent people who are endorsing this book saying, hey, something you should really read. So that's the book and that's what the information that will come from the rest of the presentation is coming straight from the book. So these are strategies taken from the book. Now, before I go into the business case studies, I want to address something that is often, very, very often asked of me. You know, hey, don't so many people give the advice that you should go with your gut? You know, that's very common advice. That's the most common, that's maybe the most widespread advice in business, that you should go with your gut when making decisions, when doing anything. Now, why do people give this advice? Why is it so common? Well, it feels very comfortable. It feels very comfortable to go with our guts. It just, it's what's natural. It's intuitive for us to go with our gut reactions, to go with our intuitions. And we often mistake what feels comfortable, what feels intuitive for what is true, for what is the right thing. That is a very common mistake. It's the way that our brain is wired and we tend to make this mistake a lot. So that's one reason why so many people, so many, whether business gurus, whether top business leaders, they make this mistake themselves. They mistake comfort, what they're comfortable with, for what is true and right. Now, business gurus have an additional reason. So people who top advisors, you know, tell you to be authentic, you know, go with your gut, follow your primal intuitions, instincts. A big reason for this is that gurus get paid lots of money for telling people what they want to hear. And people want to hear things that are comfortable for them. People really want to hear these things. And so gurus tell them what they want to hear. It's unfortunate, but that's how it happens. There is another reason that's specific to really successful people. And here it is. It helps successful people justify their success. It makes it seem almost magical. It helps them say, hey, I just have a great gut and that's why I'm successful. <laughs> so that's how, you know, instead of being in the right place at the right time or so many other reasons for why people get successful, which we can go in, into, but it's not because of their gut intuitions. That's not why they're successful. Uh, our gut is actually not evolved for the current business environment. And we have to understand that. It's evolved for this environment, for the, our evolutionary background in the tribal savanna, in that primal ancestral savanna. That's what it's evolved for. And our ancestors survived due to two primary things, the fight or flight response. It was critical for them to be able to very quickly react to dangers that potentially weren't there. It was great for them from a survival perspective to jump at a hundred shadows if they managed to get away from a single snake because they wouldn't have survived if they fell prey to that snake. Now, we don't have nearly as many dangers, life-threatening dangers in our current environment, but we still react to somebody's constructive critical feedback in a way that as though it's a snake or a tiger, you hear the saber-toothed tiger response. That's what it is very threatening, very problematic. 
The other one is strong tribalism. We feel strongly in that tribal environment, it was very important to be, feel as though as we're part of our tribe, of our small tribe of 20 people, 50 people, and so on. And to be opposed to any other tribe, this was very important for us to emotionally have that behavior. Because if you weren't, if the tribe couldn't stick together, they wouldn't, it wouldn't survive. That would be pretty bad. <laughs> so that's another reason why tribalism is so important. And right now we still feel intuitive tribalism. We feel like we want to be with people who we like and who we care about and who we feel we are similar to. And we don't want to be with people who we don't like, who we don't care about and who we don't feel similar to, even though those people might be great and wonderful and they might be the best fit for our being a business partner, business collaborator. Now, our basic intuitions, what those are, are a great fit for the Savannah environment, but they're really bad for the modern professional world. Because, as I mentioned, this constructive critical feedback, we tend to have a defensive response or an aggressive response. We want to shout back at somebody or we want to, you know, close our ears and say, la, 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 I can't hear you. Not a good fit. The same thing for tribalism. We tend to discriminate against people. It's our intuitions to discriminate against people who aren't like us. And that's really bad in the modern multicultural globalized business environment. We make really bad decisions based on that. We also tend to make bad decisions because we favor people who are like us or who can appear to be like us. And that, of course, causes us to have a lot of problems. Now, a big problem for many people with accepting that idea that going with their gut is a, not good <laughs> is that gut reactions is a fuzzy concept. It combines really healthy learned behaviors with dangerous intuitive ones. Now, what are healthy learned behaviors? So let's say you learned over time to take constructive critical feedback, but let's even take Another behavior, let's talk, say, driving a car. Remember how hard it was to learn to drive a car? It was incredibly difficult. I remember, I mean, I mean, being honest, I mean, I failed my first driving test. Uh, it was so hard to learn how to drive a car. It was very not intuitive, it was very uncomfortable. But now I drive an autopilot. It feels like I'm driving with my gut and intuitions and my instincts. However, it's a learned behavior. The same learned behavior that if you learned how to take constructive critical feedback well, you welcome it, you invite it, you say, hey, somebody tells you something that, that's a problem, you know, a customer tells you that's a problem with your product, not maybe if even if they tell it to you not very nicely, you can have, you can intuitively have the response of like, hey, that's great information. Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate it. That's not very intuitive at all. <laughs> you have to learn how to do that. You also have to learn how to do effective delegation to others. Not a very intuitive behavior at all, but people in supervisory positions who have been there for a while have learned how to do it very easily. You might very easily and very effectively delete spam emails from your inbox. But then of course, that took a lot of time to learn how to do that. <laughs> you know, if you ask somebody, let's say, uh, you know, your grandpa connects to the internet for the first time, or not for the first time, but maybe not uh, savvy, they will not be able to separate those spam emails from real emails. So that's another example of the healthy learned behaviors versus the dangerous intuitive ones, the ones that come from our tribal instinct, the fight or flight response or the fight or flight response. So those are the dangerous ones that we want to be aware of and address. So that's why I strongly encourage you to always check with your head before going with your gut because it's very tempting for us to follow our intuitions. We're very comfortable with them, but they will often lead us into trouble. Even if they're the right things, we might we are unable to tell whether they're the right things. You know, it feels just as comfortable and intuitive to take a second cookie as it does to drive a car or as it does to delegate a task effectively. But as you know, in the Savannah environment, it was very important for us to eat as many sweets as possible. Whereas in the modern environment, the overabundance of sweets leads to the obesity epidemic. So that's another example of where our gut steer, steers us in the wrong direction. These are things that are called cognitive biases. These are dangerous judgment errors because of how our brain is wired, because of our evolutionary heritage that you need to be able to address and avoid the problems that come from falling into these cognitive biases. 
And the one that I just mentioned with the basketball is called the attentional bias, where if we're looking at something, focusing on something, like counting the number of passes, we will tend to miss other really very important things that are critical for us to see, like the gorilla, like the black, like the player in black leading the team, like the curtain changing color. Now, of course, there are other major examples. The normalcy bias is another cognitive bias. Normalcy bias, a good example of that is with Boeing 737 MAX, the problem that's happening right now. Boeing is couldn't imagine that one of its airplanes, I mean, Boeing has a great record of safety, it couldn't imagine that one of its airplanes would screw up so much that it would need to change things around. And it rushed the job on the airplane, rushed production, and caused an airplane to come into flight that was obviously that was obviously flawed in very many ways. As we can see, they haven't been able to fix it for the last year. They rushed it way too much, but they couldn't imagine, the bosses, the leadership couldn't imagine that it's their safety record would be impeded even though a number of engineers warned them. Another one, overconfidence. There are very, very many examples of overconfidence in business. The latest one, that I, big one, is the WeWork IPO, where they were greatly overconfident about the evaluation of their company, the valuation of their company at $47 billion and also its governance structure. Now, when the market investors actually started investigating things, they saw that the governance structure was very screwed up to give the founder too much power, and the value of the company dropped from 47 billion to about 15 billion. That's 30 billion in value wiped out. <laughs> and they pulled out of the IPO, so because it looked like it would be at 15 billion, which is crazy. Uh, so that's another one. Now. Another example is the confirmation bias, where we tend to look for information that we want to see and we ignore information that doesn't fit our beliefs. The Me Too movement and the sexual harassment claims that have come up in many organizations recently, Uber is a big example, is an example of confirmation bias, where leaders weren't looking for information that was, or they were actively ignoring information about sexual harassment scandals. Optimism bias. Oh, this is a great example. This, so many people fell prey to the optimism bias in 2008 with the great housing bubble, when they thought that their housing values would just keep rising and rising and rising and rising and rising. And of course, they didn't. And lots of people lost their homes. Lots of companies lost their headquarters. Lots of companies went bankrupt because they weren't prepared for the Great Recession. Now, the illusion of transparency is a really interesting one. The illusion of transparency has to do with the fact that when we explain things to others, we think we're much better at explaining things and communicating things than we actually are. So if you look at the research on, hey, how well do I think I communicated something? Somebody would say, I did a nine out of 10. And when you ask the listener how the other person did, they say the communicator did a six out of 10. <laughs> So that's a big problem. And this is a, commonly a problem in companies. So when I go and do strategic planning for a company I, with a client, it's very difficult for me to do an exercise of saying, hey, what are your next, what are your priorities for the next five years? List your top five priorities anonymously. I ask each member of the leadership team and list them in the order that you think they're the most important. So top and uh, one, two, three, four, five. I think only twice in out of about 150 of these strategic planning sessions was there significant alignment among the leadership. The large majority of the time they don't say the same things for their strategic priorities in the next five years. And even if they do say the same things, they have them all over the map in terms of priority. What is the number one? What is the number two? And so on. So I'm really surprised. I was quite surprised, very pleasantly surprised at those five times, at those two times out of 150 when they actually were aligned. So that's another example. Now the false consensus effect. This is a great example where we tend to think other people are more similar to us than they actually are. So there's a false sense of consensus between us and other people. So an example is older managers and younger employees. Why is there a big problem in the millennial, engaging millennials, there's so many people talking about engaging millennials, 
because all their leaders tend to think of younger people as younger versions of themselves. They think, oh, this is a younger version of myself, you know, who's coming in. And they don't notice that these younger people are actually have different characteristics in a number of ways. The younger people prefer much more. Uh, so, for example, the older people prefer much more desire for security and safety as part of their jobs, whereas younger people focus much more on meaning and fulfillment. So we know that, we've learned that, and it's very hard for older leaders to see that. Older leaders prefer traditional face-to-face -face socialization, and they're pretty extroverted, whereas younger people, millennials, people who are digital natives, tend to be much more introverted because they're used to engaging with technology and through technology and much more focused on technological engagement. So that's another example of uh, this, false, this bias. The planning fallacy, this is a great one. We tend to think that our plans will go according to plan. And of course, they often do not. So for example, there was a study, a 2002 study of major construction projects that found that 86% of these construction projects went over budget. And a 2014 study of large IT projects found that only 16% succeeded in meeting the original budget of and of the 83, 84% that didn't, the average cost overrun was 189%. 189%, imagine that. Imagine your project that's, let's say, putting in a new database that costs 3 million, rising by 189%. So it's a, that would be something like, what is 180? So that would be close to 9 billion, no, I'm sorry, 9 million. So instead of 3 million, it would be close to 9 million. Crazy, right? And that's, that's a big problem. Now, another example is the halo effect and the horns effect. So this is a big challenge from a tribal perspective. The halo effect says that if we like one characteristic of a person, we will tend to like all of their other characteristics. And the horns effect is the opposite. If we dislike one characteristic of a person that is important to us, that is salient to us, we'll dislike all of their other characteristics. So the great example of this was a presentation I did here in Columbus, Ohio. It's important to know that Columbus, Ohio is the home of the Buckeyes, the OSU Buckeyes, go Bucks. So that's the, at the, t at the time I was a professor at Ohio State and I was giving a presentation to the local group of HR professionals called Hraco, and they were from the central Ohio area. And our big rivals for Ohio State is the University of Michigan, the University of Michigan Wolverines. And so I asked them, how many of you, there were about 100 people, would hire a Michigan fan, University of Michigan fan? And you know what? How many of them raised their hands when I asked them that? Only three. Three people raised their hands. It was you know, <laughs> ridiculous, but that's what it was. So that was an interesting example of how the hell and horns effect affects even trained HR professionals. And there were over a hundred more cognitive biases. You can check them out on Wikipedia. There's a list of them on Wikipedia and I'm kind of defining them, citing the research. If you want to focus on how they impact and how they're impacted in business settings, you want to take a look at my book, Never Go With Your Gut, which describes the 30 most dangerous cognitive biases for businesses and careers and how you can defeat them. Now, the keys to dealing with dangerous judgment errors. We're getting to the part of dealing with them. You want to learn about them and watch out for them always. Integrate this knowledge into your team and your organization and implement research-based strategies to address them. The first thing that you want to think about is caring. The cognitive biases come from an emotional place, so you need to get people to care about addressing them. Just knowing about them doesn't do it. You want to get people to care about them because the large majority of our decision-making comes from an emotional place. You know, when I said at the beginning, the leaders of Enron, Tycho, and WorldCom, when, why did they commit this fraud, even though they knew they wouldn't really get away with it, go to jail and stuff? Well, when we investigated later why, we found that it really came from an emotional place. They feared. It was a fear of being seen as losers, as failures in front of other leaders. At that time, when they were that wealthy, the most important thing for them was social status and competition, and they just couldn't bear seeing themselves as losers or being seen as losers by others. And so to address cognitive biases, we need to identify when we fall into these mistakes 
and recognize the pain caused by these mistakes. And the great way to do that is the assessment and dangerous judgment errors, which you should have gotten as part of signing up for this webinar and put in the chat uh, if you didn't get it. An example of the question, percent of projects that missed the deadline or went over budget. So think about how many projects missed the deadline or went over budget in the company, in your company over the last year, or let's say you might not know in your company, but just around you when you know in your department, or let's say things that you did personally, how many projects missed the deadline or went over budget? Answer that. I usually get people saying anywhere from 30 to 70%. How many percent of team conflicts occurred because someone overestimated the effectiveness of their communication skills and persuasiveness? This is a very common thing that occurs for companies. So you want to think about how often that happens for you. And well, the usually the answers I get to this one are 60 to 90 percent. Of all significant decisions, in what percent of cases was someone on the team overconfident about making the decision? Was someone felt overconfidence? I typically get people saying anywhere from 20 to, this is very variable, 20 to 80 percent. So the first one, of course, has to do with the planning fallacy. We mentioned this cognitive bias before. The second has to do with illusion of transparency. And the third has to do with overconfidence. Now, what people typically do with the assessment and dangerous judgment errors, and this is, it's meant to assess the 30 most dangerous judgment errors in the workplace and how they occurred how often they occurred in the past year. I mentioned that that's what the book is about and the assessment is at the heart of the book. It helps leaders evaluate the impact of these errors on your bottom line and what next steps you can take to address these problems. I want to encourage you to take the assessment yourself and get your team to do so. So for everyone to learn about these dangerous judgment errors and to care about them, to know and care, because once you know about them, once you know about the pain caused, that's when you care. Next step is actually avoiding these problems. So we have the awareness, but the avoiding disasters is really important. An ounce of prevention in this case is worth a pound of cure. I really like this line by Ben Franklin. So there are five questions that I would recommend you ask for avoiding decision disasters. Five questions. First, what important information did I not yet fully consider? And what you want to specifically focus on is information that goes against your preferred option. What information goes against your intuitions, your preferences, because you want to address things like the confirmation bias and a lot of other biases. By the way, just to be clear, these are going to go for two strategies that address automatically a great deal of these biases. And this is one of them. It's for everyday daily decision making. You can ask these questions for any decision on everyday level. It takes less than five minutes to ask the questions once you have practiced with it. What relevant dangerous judgment errors did I not yet address? And we talked about a bunch of them. And of course, you should learn about them and start to notice them in your life. What would a trusted and objective advisor suggest I do? Think about people who are trusted and objective advisors for you and what you can do to address these problems. What then? <laughs> How have I addressed all the ways that this could fail? That's a critical question to ask, and that's really important to address and pr to prevent problems going forward. How have I addressed all the ways it could fail? That's when you already made the decision. The first three help you make the decision. Then this one helps you implement it effectively. And the last one is also really important for implementing it effectively because you want to think about what new information will cause you to revisit this decision. Because, of course, if you don't think about it in advance, First of all, two things happen. People tend to stick to their decisions, especially leaders. They tend to be seen as weak if they change their minds. But if they decide in advance, hey, this is what would cause me to change my mind, it's much easier to change your mind and be seen as a strong leader because you committed to changing your mind based on that. It also helps prevent problems in later team dynamics. I've seen so many teams have conflicts because some people oppose the initial decision and when any negative information comes up they say hey told you so this was a bad decision so if you decide in advance what could cause you to change your mind that would prevent a lot of the problems going forward now this is a more major technique so you want to use this for more significant decisions than your daily decisions so it's eight steps to making the best decisions the five questions are to make a decision that's good enough for a daily setting. Now, this one is for something that really significantly impacts your bottom line. Eight steps. 
recognize that a decision needs to be made. It's often very frequent that people don't recognize when a decision needs to be made. So for example, uh, a common example is Kodak. When it didn't recognize the shift to digital cameras, it was the king of film. It actually invented a digital camera. Kodak did, it's engineer in 1984. But it chose not to invest into digital cameras and the world passed it by and it went bankrupt. Collect relevant information from a range of informed perspectives on the issue. So you want to make sure that you don't only listen to people with power, that you listen to people with expertise. If Boeing listened to the engineers, then they would have not released 737 MAX. Determine your goals and envision the desired outcome. So you want to make sure that you know what you want to achieve, not that you kind of rush to a certain conclusion, but you want to focus on knowing what you want to achieve as part of this outcome. Develop clear decision-making criteria to evaluate, to evaluate your options so that you know why you're making the decision the way you are, not just kind of randomly because this is what my gut feels like. Generate viable options that can achieve your goals. This is really important. This is a common, very common mistake very, that really brings down companies. So for example, GE recently had to, about two years ago, had to fire its CEO who was there for about a year because he was doing an incompetent job. And whenever a company like GE fires the CEO after a year or after a few months, after less than, after less than five years, in fact, well, okay, less than three years, then you know the board didn't generate enough viable options that they settled too quickly for an option. They didn't look at all the options that they should have. Weigh the options and then pick the best ones. Implement the option you chose and evaluate the implementation process and revise as necessary. So this is part is the implementation. You want to implement it effectively and revise it as necessary if the implementation shows that you have, haven't done as well as you wish. Now, often you'll find yourself skipping between these steps, up and down, you know, step, you know, let's say you weigh the options and then you figure out, oh, I didn't generate enough viable options and you want to go back to number five. Or when you're developing clear decision-making criteria, you figure out, I don't have enough information, you can go back to number two. So it's not something you need to go in a pure progression, but you can jump back and forth as you need. Now, you want, may, of course, all of this stuff is in the book, but if you want to figure out how to address and adapt it to your needs, here are three ways you can do so. Through an online course, through an executive mastermind and executive coaching. Now, all of this information is available at tinyurl.com slash nevergut. Again, tinyurl never, tinyurl.com slash nevergut, and it should be in your chat window. This online course is one of the three options that you have. Now, the goal of this online course, that's a course of 10 live webinar modules, one dealing with each book chapter. So the way it will be structured is that we will, I will email everyone in advance to ask them about, hey, what you'll read the book chapter in advance, and I will email everyone and ask you, hey, what do you think of this book chapter? What are the useful strategies in it that you want to adapt to your context? And then in the webinar itself, I'll focus the first part on breaking down the strategies, the second part on answering your questions that were emailed to me in advance, and the third part on a Q&A. And so you'll get the benefit of an in-depth exploration of each strategy in the book. So that's the online course. Then the executive mastermind. So that's the other option. It's targeted at executives. It's an exclusive small group mastermind, again, 10 sessions. It's limited to six participants only with an executive master with ex executive background. And that means you know, someone from the C-suite, mid-level managers, business owners, that each session will focus again on each one of the book sections and will focus on applying the book section to the needs of each participant. Because there are only six participants, everyone will have sufficient time to talk about, hey, what's going on in their context and what they need to learn. They'll get feedback not only from me, but also from everyone else in the group, which is incredibly helpful as part of a mastermind to get feedback from other people with executive experience to your needs. So that's when you'll get the benefits to adapt the strategies to your specific needs 
and you get the benefits of everyone else, you'll also get the benefits of mutual support and accountability. I'll pair you off as part of the mastermind and you will work with each with a partner throughout the week in between the sessions. You'll also commit to certain next steps and report out at the next session on what the next steps were that you took. So that's going to be the mastermind. Now, the other option is executive coaching. The executive coaching, you know, some folks prefer to do an executive mastermind. They like to work with other executives. Others prefer a much more customized experience. So it's a, and the executive coaching is going to be a thoroughly customized experience of 10 sessions where I'll meet with you. I will provide you with support. We'll go over each book chapter and over each book section, talk about how it applies to your needs, go in depth into any issue you would like to whatever extent it's related to the book, but also outside the book as you're inspired by the issue and go through all of the sections so that you can deeply integrate and adapt the strategies to your individual needs. And I'll also provide you, of course, with accountability as I will do as the members of the mastermind provide to each other. I will, as the coach, provide you with accountability during the executive coaching. So I want you to remember as part of this presentation, the key takeaways that you need to have from this presentation. These are really crucial. Never simply go with your gut. It's very intuitive, very tempting, very dangerous. Watch out for dangerous judgment errors. Make sure that you learn about the 30 most dangerous judgment errors in business settings and address them. And integrate the strategies, the eight questions, uh, the eight, uh, I'm sorry, the eight steps for major making the best decisions and the five questions to avoid decision disasters into your daily activities.